the resounding theme of the book of Revelation is that Jesus is king, that he provides certainty in uncertain times, uh, that Jesus is sovereign, he is in control, that he has a plan, and through the power of his spirit, we can be his witnesses that preach and share his message with power and mercy and love. Amen? Amen. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is our leader, and he deserves more than a four-year term. He should, we should gladly want him to be the king of our heart because he leads us to streams of living water. Amen? Amen. Jesus, as per usual, is going to use the book of Revelation in a mighty way to reveal his love, but also his justice. He's going to use this mighty book to reveal his mercy, but also his wrath. Uh, as you may know, Revelation is 22 chapters of awe-inspiring awesomeness. Uh, a lot of people avoid it, though. I, I had some per, uh, a person actually tell me very politely, like, um, man, I, I'm, I'm pretty nervous about Revelation. You know, I, I not a... Not a, a, a book of the Bible that gets me all excited to come to church to hear. You know, just being real with man, it's like, man, uh, we need this book. And, and I feel you, there's some, there's some weird stuff in this book, but some amazing stuff. Uh, like we talked about last week, Jesus sets off from heaven what's, what seems to be almost like a fireworks show it has, that, that has seven seals or almost like seven fuses to this big fireworks. But it's not a fireworks show on the 4th of July for our enjoyment, but to bring, bring mankind to its knees, um, seeing their need for a savior and a king. Today, the fireworks continue as we see some more judgment uh, take place. And what's the difference between the judgments we're gonna see today and the judgments we saw last week? Last week, uh, was, or, or, or excuse me, this week will be uh, the wrath of God. We'll see the wrath of God. Last week was the wrath of man. Uh, almost imagine like parents that are kind of fed up with, it's like, man, they're teenagers, they keep fighting, and the parents are like, you know what? Let them put on the boxing gloves and, and, and have it out for a while. But, but this is way more intense than that. The, this is the wrath of man where God allows man to fold on itself in a way. Uh, this week in chapters eight and nine, the wrath of God begins, and this is, uh, all about the seventh seal is about to be open, so it's it's the leading up to it. And at first, it's almost like uh, remember, like like a fuse that uh, doesn't go off. It's like a dud almost at first. You guys ever had the experience that where you you light a firework? Um, well, I go to a place where fireworks are legal. I go to um, Montana, and uh, we, we, on the 4th of July, light fireworks. My parents are amazing. Don't you love them? But anyways, uh, as, a, as like a 17-year-old, I remember my parents just being like, you gotta be careful. Like, if it doesn't go off, you don't just run back out there because it could go off. It might take a second. And I, I remember just going out there slowly. Like, after I'd lit the fuse, it, it bent, it's like, this is taking forever. It's taking forever. Nothing's going off. So, okay, it's fine. You go out there, and then boom, it, it goes off. Luckily, I was far away still. But this is something like that where it almost seems like a dud. It's like almost like kind of uh, this intermission. Like, what is happening? Is God doing anything? What's this kind of uh, moment in time of almost silence in heaven? And then all of a sudden, these seven angels come out with seven trumpet judgments, and they're not playing the, you know, the Rocky theme final countdown, although that would be cool. They are playing something different, and that's what we're going to talk about, um, just to, to kind of set the table for what's going on. So this is, I want to remind you, two things are simultaneously happening at, uh, at once. So last week, we talked about the, uh, the awe-inspiring glimpse and picture of the multi-ethnic multitude. Uh, of, you, you can't count it. I mean, it's like, uh, just eons of people worshiping every tribe, tongue, just all praising Jesus. It's awesome. That was last week. And so what's amazing is worship is still happening. So you have worship in heaven and you have wrath happening at simultaneously. God is good, whether it's wrath or his grace. And here's the deal. You are going to bring glory to God either by receiving his grace and mercy, or you will glorify his justice by rejecting him. Either way, God will be glorified. So anyways, I want you to understand that, um, that, that two things are happening at once. There's worship in heaven and the wrath of God being dispensed on 
mankind to bring them to their knees so they would actually submit to him and turn to him and experience his love and grace. Okay, that's, that's the whole point. Um, here's the four trumpets of judgment. Uh, they're, they're very serious, very intense. And yes, we are doing a baby dedication later, just how it coincided. But anyways, a very intense <laughs> chapter here. So here's the four trumpets of, of judgment. They involve one-third of the earth being burnt. One-third of the sea creatures will be destroyed. One-third of sea and fresh water taken away. And then one-third of the sky's light will be taken away. Now, I just, that took me maybe 15 seconds to read that. But this is like the worst news ever. It's the most serious thing that the world has ever experienced. Great tragedy. Uh, terrible loss will occur through all of this. And then you have the fifth trumpet uh, judgment. is like something out of a horror movie. It will involve man-eating locusts. So imagine locusts not descending on crops, but descending on people. Like, you guys have all seen A Bug's Life, right? You know, remember the locusts, the grasshoppers of the bad guys? Um, yeah, that would be wonderful, that, that what it was. No, it, it's way worse than that. Um, uh, imagine, I, the best way I could kind of describe it is like a, a lion, not that I know from experience what this would be like, but it'd be like if a lion got a hold of you and just decided not to eat you, but just gnaw on you, maul you, and just not eat you for months, just like kept you alive and just kept gnawing on you. And um, Anyways, you can still take your kids to children's church if you need to, but uh, <laughs> anyways, so I, I hope you have good dreams. Okay, every, I'm sorry, but I... I don't write the news. I'm just sharing it with you. I got to be faithful. I can't apologize for the word of God. This is, it's good and bad. It's bitter and sweet. Here we are. All right. So Revelation 9, 5 and 6, just so you think I'm not making stuff up, it's right here. They were allowed, these locusts were allowed to torment people for five months. People are going to want to, they, they wish they could die, right? But not to kill them, but to torment them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Mankind is slow to pay attention. Mankind is slow to learn a lesson. God is trying to wake them up, trying to get their Attention, much like if you go to the story of Exodus, Pharaoh was very stubborn, very, very stubborn, not going to tap out. Like it took, took forever, right? By the way, when these terrible events are a, uh, occurring, if a person has a seal of Christ, in other words, um, simply put, the blood of Jesus Christ is over the doorpost of their heart. I always say doorpost because when you have the last plague dispensed on Egypt in the time of Moses, what was the cure? To take the blood of the lamb and smear it with a hyssop branch and smear it over the doorpost and hide in the home. And so when the wrath of God came, it passed over the homes, not that we're righteous and perfect and had all the religiosity all figured out. There were sinners in there, but they had faith in the what? Blood. So no matter what your eschatology is, you know, I, I'm hoping and praying for uh, a primo uh, uh, that we're actually caught up with him, that we avoid the scorpions and all that stuff. If you actually are post-mill and you believe we're here during this tribulation, you know what? It'd be like, hey, this is going to increase my faith because I'm actually seeing revelation unfold. This is, can you imagine being there when the plagues are being dispensed during Moses' time? I'd be like, God is real. He's awesome. I, but this, okay, is terrible. But, I mean, God is real. Right? I'd be preaching. So whether we're here or not, we are sealed with Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen. Such good news. What seals us is the cross of Christ. In the days of Noah, Noah and his family were preaching that a flood was coming. Well, I want to preach today that a flood of water is not coming, but a, a flood of wrath that is coming for those that have not trusted in Christ. And the, the, the lumber for the boat that we trust in is right there, friends. So let's keep going with this, this pep band section of angels playing their trumpets. The pre, there's, there's this sixth trumpet that is very interesting. 
The sixth trumpet of judgment will prompt the army of 200 million from the east to attack Israel. So I, I want your attention for a second, guys. Listen, when, when we saw Israel get attacked not very long ago, they're still dealing, like right now it's still unsafe to go there. If you actually look at like, oh, should we tour Jerusalem right now? It is not safe for you to, to head there uh, right now. They're dealing with Hamas and other terrorists terrorizing and, and, and attacking. Um, this, what we're talking about here is, is uh, not to make light of like, I mean, Hamas is a real thing, but this is, this is incredible. 200 million from the east will march um, and, and, and attack Israel. We don't know what country we don't know. It's, it's going to be probably a conglomerate, but they're from the east. And, they, um, and this is just the pre-battle. This is just like the jamboree. This is not even the real army uh, or the real battle in Armageddon. That's going to be in chapter 16. This is the jamboree. This is the pre-battle. And, and this is no small thing. In this pre-battle, it will be very intense. One-third of mankind will be obliterated. And, and so around four billion We'll, we'll die in this. And so this should prompt us to sell everything and move to Idaho and, and bury our head in the sand. That's what we should do immediately. All right? Give up. No, we should preach the gospel. Let's preach the gospel. <laughs> I do love Idaho, but come on, guys. Jeez. In chapter 10, we will see an angel uh, tell John to do something that seems like something out of an Alice in Wonderland movie. Now, some of you are like, how dare you? This is the word of God. How dare you make, make it into a Disney movie? Okay, but John doesn't shrink or grow or anything like that, like Alice in Wonderland. Um, but he does eat. He's told to eat a scroll, and it has different flavors. Like, it starts out sweet, and then it gets bitter. Let's define it up here. Sweet, and the fact that the scroll that he's compelled and called to eat is, is here's, here's what it's about. It's, it's sweet in the fact that the kingdom of God is coming to earth. Friends, this is really incredible good news. Did, did you just hear the news? The kingdom of God is literally physically coming to earth. We've been talking about it, that uh, it's been, for the last 2,000 years, it's been, Jesus has been doing a spiritual takeover, not a physical takeover, a spiritual takeover using his witnesses, us, the church, right, to, to preach the gospel. It's, a, it's been a spiritual takeover, but guess what's going to happen? Also a physical takeover, literally physically. He, he will come with clouds, and, and, and then there will be a new heaven and a new earth. This is not allegorical and cute. Like This is amazing. This is such good news. But it will also not just be sweet, it will be bitter in the fact that so many will die. The first part of chapter 11 is really a continuation of this interlude or intermission between this devastating scene of God's wrath and then Christ's triumphant return. This intermission reminds us that God is in control and that there will be no more delay for the final trumpet is about to be played. Before it does, before the culmination of our salvation and Jesus returns with this seventh trumpet blast, there first has to be this dynamic duo of preachers with marvelous power. These, these are preachers that you, you don't want to like be caught like on your phone. Like I, I could see some of you guys maybe scrolling on your phone or whatever. Like you wouldn't want to like be doing something else. You wouldn't want to like fall asleep in their sermon. All right? Um, I, and I'm, I'm kind of not kidding. You're going to see them literally have not just spiritual power, but physical power. Like something out of an Avengers movie or X-Men movie. And some of you are like, oh, how dare you? Really? These are preachers that if you mess with them, they have fire come out of their mouth and it consumes you. That's intense. Okay. Maybe you believe it's allegorical. I don't know. But uh, this would pale in comparison to any... Uh, machine gun preacher, maybe you've heard of that. There was literally, true story, uh, a preacher that went to Africa. He was tired of seeing uh, terrorists kidnap kids and, and all that stuff. So he, he got a machine gun, went, you know, Rambo style on him. Anyways, um, I'm not saying that's a, I'm neither here nor there. I'm just telling you the truth. That's what happened. These, these preachers, it will pale in comparison to any machine gun preacher or something like this. Uh, and I, I believe this is not poetic imagery, but it's to be taken literally. 
Um, I, I think, look at Moses. Did Moses just preach? What do you guys think? Okay, what did, what did he do with the, the staff? What did what, the water do, right? Was it just a little neat boat races picture of the water? No, the, 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 yeah, the water parted. Amazing. He literally was able to call hail down from the sky. Like, these guys will have this kind of power. Are, are, we, are we called to have power? Acts 1 and verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come up upon you. Now, we're not going to have, we don't, I don't think any of you, tell me if you do, have the power that these guys are going to have. This is a special power that they will have at the end of the world. This dynamic duo of preachers will have unrestricted power till the beast is released and will kill them. But is that the end of the story? I don't know. Let's find out. Buckle up. Buttercup, here we go. We're in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the, to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. You guys think my sermons are long? Okay, it's a long sermon. <laughs> They're going to be clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees. So this is, this is an Old Testament term. Uh, talked about Zerubbabel and, and Joshua. We, we see that, but we're going to get to that later on, on who these two guys could actually be. Is it a cameo of Joshua and Zerubbabel? Is it Moses? Is it Joshua? We'll get to that. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying and preaching, right? And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast, uh, some have said this is Satan. Satan is actually described as the dragon. The beast, I believe, is the Antichrist. And it says that the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt. So this is taking place in the Middle East. Where their Lord was crucified for three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations. It's interesting. Every tribe, tongue, you know, all these different tribes, multi-ethnic, multitude, is going to be in heaven worshiping. And down here, different, all these different tribes are going to be gloating, gazing at their dead bodies. It's very interesting, the antithesis occurring. One is all these tribes worshiping and all these tribes on earth gloating. I just saw that. I, okay. I, interesting. And in those, and, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. So they're rejoicing. Is it worship? Let's find out. Rejoicing over them that are dead, by the way. And, and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days, Sunday's coming, right? Or three, but after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. This is my favorite part. Verse 12, look at this. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. Right? You know, kids that are playing downstairs, especially if they're like on the switch or playing video games, like one of the things they don't want to hear is, get up here from their parents. I want to hear from God the Father, come up here. That's a great thing. Can I hear an amen? amen. Come, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake. And a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Some may say, where's God's mercy? Did you just hear what I said, the last part there, what the word says? 
and the rest were terrified and killed? No, no, no. And the rest were terrified, and what did they do? Gave glory. Gave glory to the God of heaven. And the second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. What a passage, and what a God that we serve. It looks for a moment that these two preachers have lost, that maybe you're on the wrong team if you're like cheering for these guys, and then they go down, and you're like, Oh, just kidding, I, I, I'm not rooting for them. <laughs> and, you know, it almost feels like they're losing, right? And yet with resurrection power, they rise. We need to know this, friends, that out of trials, God can bring great triumph. No one can crush or kill the, the Lord in you, right? No one can, can, can put out the fire that burns bright in you. You have Jesus alive in you if you have faith in him. You have the lion of the tribe of Judah alive in you. Look at Christ dying for our sins at the cross. Like, How many of you, just for a moment, you don't need to raise your hand, was thinking, gosh, this seems so much like the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and then even ascension. Get up here, right? Jesus ascending into heaven. I mean, it's like the Easter story all over again, like Good Friday. It's... Satan at first is gloating, gloating and celebrating Jesus in the tomb. But little does he know Sunday is coming. In the moment where it seemed that Satan had won his greatest victory because Jesus, the Messiah, was in the tomb. But again, Sunday is coming. When Jesus would rise from the dead on resurrection Sunday, He would redeem us, purchase us, purchase our adoption with his own precious and righteous blood. It's not our religiosity. It's not our ability to, you know, just if I ceremonially and clean myself up and spray on my religious cologne and, you know, just really, you know, on my Instagram photo of me reading the Bible, it's just just everything's perfect. The coffee's, I mean, just everything. No, it's the blood of the Lamb. It's plain and simple. And Jesus didn't just just rise from the, the grave. This is the worst part that Satan hates is that he has clothed us in righteousness. He's purchased us from slaves, being slaves to Satan, to sons and daughters of, of God the Father through Christ. Let's go. Now let's look at Revelation and see again. It looks, it, the enemy thinks he's won. All the people who belong to this world will gloat over them, these two witnesses that are dead, and give presents to each other, celebrating the death of the two prophets who, who had tormented them. It'd almost be if, like, you know, Pharaoh was able to kill Moses and Aaron and be like, yes, we did it, which did not happen, but it'd be like, we won. Crossview, I want to ask you, look at your own life. Maybe you are feeling underwater. Maybe you are feeling like you are losing. You feel like you're drowning. You feel like you can barely keep your head above water. You're maybe facing immense stress and adversity. Maybe it seems like the enemy is, is winning. In Christ, you have resurrection power. Do you believe that? Do you know that? The same power that rose Jesus from the grave can reside in you if you have faith in him. There is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You are a new creation. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Nothing can overcome Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look at our story in Revelation. It's my favorite part. And I, I, I got to be honest with you. I was at the Toby Mac concert at the Toyota Center this week. It was awesome worship time, just great. And he was, he was sharing a story about losing his son. And, just, um, and I, I remember just in, in that moment kind of just, 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 thinking about like just tough things that have happened and, and then like looking at the passage and seeing a picture of the gospel and it was this part 
that just gave me an extra skip in my step. There's so much hope in it. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them and they stood up. Are you ready this week to stand up? Come Monday morning, if, if, if God doesn't come back yet, that we would actually stand up and preach the gospel and stand and rise, not just caffeinated, but, but resurrected in him, walking in resurrection power, praying for the breath of God through his word, through his spirit to breathe life to us. This is what happens when we trust in Christ. He breathes life back into us. We see this in the story. Great triumph comes out of trials. So when you see everything failing, know that God has a faithful plan. Let me say it again. When you see everything failing, know that God has a faithful plan. When you actually give your life to Christ and you stand up and you're like, you confess your sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins, and, and you, you're walking in him. He doesn't promise to roll out the red carpet and remove every obstacle, but he promises to walk with us and many times carry us and empower us. A big problem, you can see it on the screen, is allowing suffering to keep us from sharing our faith. Go, oh, look, what, look what happened to these witnesses. The beast... Took him out. I want to ask you something. The, the early Christians that were fed to, that were willing to, to actually preach the gospel, they knew, that they knew they were threatened. They knew it was illegal. The early Christians were not fed to wild beasts or forced to be used as human lamps. They were like dipped in kerosene and literally forced to, to light Nero the emperor Nero's garden, human torches. There was no electricity. So people, Christians specifically, were either fed to, to lions, wild beasts or whatever, at a, like a gladiator thing. It would be like the, the kickoff. Before we bring the gladiators out, let's just put the stupid Christians out there on the, and watch them just get fed. This is what happens to you if you are silly enough to actually be a Christian. Do you think that these people were willing to risk their life because they thought Jesus was just a nice Sunday life coach? Or do you think they actually witnessed him change their life? They witnessed him remove their fear of death. And it doesn't mean that we don't wrestle with fear at times, but our faith in him is overcoming our fear within He's not just a nice Sunday life coach. He is our savior. He's our redeemer. And I want to ask you something. Is Jesus just your Sunday life coach or is he your best friend? Is he your savior? Is he your redeemer that you're trusting in? And then are you willing to rise up and stand up and be witnesses for him? Or do you want to kind of sit silently on the, on the, on the, on the bench of life letting the enemy kill you softly? You get on the field, you're going to get hit hard. But sitting in isolation is suffocation on the bench. He's going to just kill you silently and softly, tenderly. I'd rather be on the field, friends. Disciples are not meant to be consumers, but producers. We're not called to be spectators, but gladiators for him. Do you believe this? We're not, just, we're not meant to just be preached at on Sunday and call it good. That's like a football team suiting up on Sunday, putting pads on, like painting our face. You know, all, we're all ready to go. Like, yeah, are you ready to go? And you guys ever seen where, like, you'll see players hit their head. They're wearing helmets, but they're headbutting. It's like, yeah, let's go, right? And they're hitting each other's pads. You listen to a pep talk. You never step foot on the field. But after the pep talk, you take your pads off, and you're like, that was great. We know how to play football. And then we go about, like we don't, I mean, maybe we watch football the rest of the week, and then on Sunday we suit up again. We do it all over again. We listen to a pep talk. We're like, man, that's football. Yes. We never step foot on the field. Sunday is a celebration of church happening throughout the week that you are to preach the gospel. If you're like, oh, it's Pastor Robbie, Pastor Carl, Pastor Dave, Pastor Josh, you guys, you guys got this. We're your 12th man. 
We're cheering you on. You, you preach. Oh, friends, if the weight of the preaching to Tri-Cities is on Josh Pasma, and we're in trouble. It actually says that the job of the elders and pastors of the church are to equip the saints. Like how ridiculous would it be if it's like, oh, the, the coach of the Seahawks is, he's gonna play, he's gonna win it. He's got it. It's all him. We're, you guys are to be pastor, pastoring. You're the pastors of your family. You're the pastors of your neighborhood. You're the preachers. And your, your areas of, of influence live in such a way it would demand a, a gospel explanation. The people are like, there's something different about you. I want to have coffee with you. We see a measuring of the temple take place. I believe there's going to be a, a temple rebuilt, but it's not like, oh, we, we're like, yeah, we need to reinstitute the sacrificial system. Friends, we are a temple of the Lord, right? And, and we have the, the, the living, we want to be living sacrifices because we've trust in the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And we are to be the temple of the Lord. We don't just, just go to church. We invite people to be the church. We're called to be it. I want to give just a, a, a quick synopsis of these two witnesses. Who are they? Again, some people think they're, it's Moses and Elijah making a cameo appearance. These guys made a cameo uh, at, at the transfiguration in the New Testament. These guys both uh, had some very interesting th events occur surrounding their death. Like Elijah had the power to call fire down from heaven. And then he's literally taken in a chariot. So chariots of fire came out. I don't know. But it's pretty rad, right? And then Moses, you can't find his bones. So you're like, maybe it's those two cats. And then maybe it's Joshua and Zerubbabel because there's same rhetoric that's given to them in the Old Testament that we see the two olive branches. This is talked about, the two olive trees, excuse me. And, and that uh, Zechariah describes two men, Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the governor, to rebuild the temple. And there's a talk here in chapter 11 in, at the forefront, a rebuilding of the temple. So it's like, oh, maybe it's these two guys. And so I talked to Dr. Dave, and Dr. Dave and I have decided we don't know who it is. All right. I don't know. Maybe it's you. Is it you, Zach? Is it you, Fred? Is it you, Laura? Who is it? Who are these two witnesses? You know what I care about right now? Is that Jesus wins and you and me are to be witnesses. Memorize Acts 1 and memorize Acts 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my what? Witnesses. There's gonna be an exam, pop quiz next week. Okay, be ready. So what's the passage's answer? Because God has a plan, even in persecution, we should preach with power. In a few hours, Fred and I, Fred, can you raise your hand? This is Fred. Fred and I are gonna be going to Coyote Ridge Prison in, uh, in Connell, literally. We're getting in the car, we're very excited. Um, to pre uh, we've never got a chance to do this. I'm bringing my Johnny Cash guitar, I'm gonna play, it's gonna be great. Um, that hurt my leg, but uh, anyways, it's going to be awesome, right? Well, we hope. We're, we're praying for, with holy expectation that God's word is not going to return void. And so who wants to come with us? Raise your hand right now. No, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. You can't come. I'm sorry. Uh, there is, but you can eventually, hopefully. Got to pass a background check, get some training. But a lot of people let that stop them. I challenge you guys, let us know if you feel called to preach at Benton County Franklin County, get in there. They're looking for people to, that they're lost. They see themselves as prisoners. They need to see themselves as pastors. We're hoping to plant a Crossview campus in prison where the, the prisoners learn to become pastors. Some of these guys that are looking at hard time that can't come on Easter Sunday would actually be able to have a church behind bars. Who's with me in that? Does that sound awesome? Okay, let's go. Let's go. Here's the deal. You also don't have to go to prison to preach the gospel. There's people in your house that are incarcerated. I'm not talking about your teenage, teenagers or whatever. I've done, no jo all jokes aside, there are some people that are emotionally imprisoned. There's some people that are spiritually imprisoned. They're hurting. 
and they need you to show God's love to them. On a connection card, I want to give you guys a homework assignment right now. Everyone grab a connection card or a digital one on crossviewcommunity.com. I want you to pray about writing down some first names of some people that are lost that, need, that you want to see as future family. You see them as future family. There's power, there's power in prayer. And so on your way out, I want you to drop those connection cards in the giving box so we can be praying by name for people that are lost to be found. And here's the challenge. By you writing down their name, you know what you're doing? You're hopefully activating something in you that's like, hopefully the Holy Spirit, going, I should invite this person that I'm writing down to coffee. And before you're so quick to share the story of the gospel, get to know their story. Some of us, we knock on a door or whatever, and we, we share the gospel and give them like two seconds to share their story. We see they don't, they're not interested. Well, fine. Well, have you taken the chance and time to get to know their story and hear with gospel ears, listen to their need and their hurts, and then be ready for the moment to share your story and how you've experienced God's story and his gospel. Would you pray with me? Lord, help us right now just to, to be challenged, to be encouraged by your grace and your mercy, but also warned at your wrath, Lord. We are so thankful, Lord Jesus, that you bore the wrath of God on, upon yourself. You are the propitiation. You absorbed the wrath of God on the cross for us. Help us to be witnesses of experiencing your grace and glory and that we would want to be messengers. We would want with, 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 with the hope of heaven and with your spirit to share the good news, Lord, of your life, death, and resurrection and that you can melt our heart of stone and breathe life into us. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with, the, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Right now, if you're in a spot where your heart is icy and bitter, or you are like you're feeling spiritual paralysis, and you want the warmth of God's breath and mercy to come upon you. You want the spirit of the living God to melt your heart of stone and you want the spirit of the living God to breathe his spirit into you and give you new life and you want to be born again and you are in that place. Would you raise your hand? Would you call out to him? Or in a place where you want to rededicate your, yes. See those hands going up, that's awesome. Most importantly, God sees those hands. Yes, you can put them down. If you're in a place where you have not been living like a witness. You've been more silent. You've been kind of sitting on the bench and you are ready to start praying and listening and sharing the message to those that are lost right now that need to be, we need to see them as future family. If you're in that place where you're, you're ready to be a witness for him, would you raise your hand? If you're ready to follow him and, and boldly proclaim, yes, that is awesome. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you so much for your spirit that empowers us and compels us. Help us to trust in you. We pray against fear right now in the name of Jesus. We pray against any fear in this room, any fear that is, that is gripping hearts right now. We pray for freedom in this place. Holy Spirit, would you just please move into hearts, Lord? Move into hearts right now. Just pray that you... Break the, the chains. Break some of the chains of addiction. Break the chains of fear. In your precious name we pray and everyone said amen. God is good. Let's celebrate him. Amen. Hey, if we would right now, uh, this, this is going to be a time of, of response. Some of you have already started responding by filling out a connection card, letting us know who to pray for. And now